Well, it is great to see everybody this morning. Hope you guys had a great uh, Thanksgiving. Today, we are finishing up the series that we've been uh, working on over the last few weeks. Here's what we've been doing, and I'm going to tell you what we're going to do this morning. We have been working on just what it looks like to grow in your faith and, and kind of going back through mainly the Old Testament and picking out some of the characters in Scripture and just asking ourselves a question. I mean, look at their relationship with God and what is it about their relationship with God that I can take away and help in my own growth and my own maturity in Him. So today, though, we're going to kind of take off of the character idea and jump onto a, a, a kind of a concept a little bit. And the concept is going to be one, it's, it's about freedom. And I'm going to explain to you in just a minute about what I mean by that. But I was watching over the news this last week, and I'm sure you guys have been um, as well, just all about North Korea. You know, there's, there's a crazy man over there, and he has all these nuclear aspirations uh, for his country and for his people. And, of course, there's a lot of tensions between ours and theirs. And uh, we've learned a little bit about, about North Korea. We know that they're an atheist regime, uh, sprinkled in with a little bit of ancestor worship. I think somehow or another the people kind of worship or revere uh, Kim Jong-un's uh, father uh, that was there. They're, they're not doing well just health-wise. They're living through famines and food shortages. And just the people there aren't real healthy at all. The guy, did you? I don't know if you watched the, the video of the defector running across. He was driving his Jeep and he ran it off into a ditch and they got out and started running and people were shooting at him and finally he made it over to South Korea. But they said this guy's like, just a real small guy, very malnourished and just, I mean, life is just not a great place over there in North Korea. And so as Americans, we look at that and we think, well, of course, of course this guy doesn't want to live there. I mean, he wants to come to South Korea, he wants to come to the United States. I mean, anything but what you got over there. But I started asking myself this question. I was like, what is it that drove this guy to really, I mean, just, just to, to the, I guess, to the threat of his own life, to, to defect from this country, have people shoot at him? I mean, what was going on in him that would drive him to defect to South Korea? Because I don't know, I mean, you and I, we would think, well, he wants freedom, right? I mean, we, he wants out of there, and he wants into here, and he wants a different lifestyle, a better lifestyle. But I don't even know, I don't even know if they know what freedom is. I started wondering to myself, I don't even know if there's a North Korean word for freedom. Do they have a word for freedom? Because I don't even know that they have that, that concept. Because if you live in North Korea, I think the latest law that they passed was you can't sing, you can't dance, you can't drink. You have to think whatever they tell you to think. You have to work wherever they tell you to work. You can't move anywhere other than they tell you to live. And so there's not a lot of freedom there. So I wonder if they even understand what this whole concept of freedom is. And so just kind of how my mind works, I started thinking about what was it that drove this guy? What was going on in his brain that he's thinking, I don't want to live here anymore. And I'm willing to, to just really kind of put my life on the line to be able to get across to another country. We know that, that the South Koreans will play music every now and then, you know, over there by the demilitarized zone, just to kind of irritate the North Koreans. And maybe he liked it. Maybe he's thinking, I really like the music and I'd like to listen to more of it. Or, or maybe he's thinking, those guys over there, they look like they're eating better than I am. And so, you know, maybe just a plate of food was what drove him across there. But I think what happens is, is that people, whether they can identify it or not, whether or not they can articulate what it is that they're feeling, they feel oppressed. They may not use the word freedom. They may not think I'm leaving here so that I can be free, but they feel oppressed. I mean, I'm being told what I have to eat and what I have to wear, and I can't sing and I can't dance and I can't drink and I can't listen to music anymore, and I have to wear these, you know, this uniform, and I, I just everything is controlled in their life. And so at some point, you know, people, they just snap. They're just like, I can't can't do this anymore. I've got to run away. I've got to go somewhere. And so whether he could articulate the concept of freedom or not, I think that's what he was feeling. And so he runs across this border. Of course, he gets shot a couple of times and, you know, they saved his life. But when you start thinking about freedom, freedom is, it's a big deal to us. It is to you and I in Western society. It's kind of like, a, it's a part of our DNA. It's just kind of intertwined into who we are corporately as a country and who we are individually as people. We've got days, I mean, scattered throughout the year where we remind ourselves of this freedom that we enjoy in this country. We have Independence Day, right, 4th of July. The Declaration of Independence was signed 1776. If it had not been, we would be subject to the king or maybe the queen of Britain and we'd be paying taxes without representation. And so we, we, we celebrate this Independence Day on July 4th and, and just thankful for the freedoms that we have from the British you know, colonization that was going on at that time. And then we have Memorial Day too. And that's the day 
that we memorialize, that I don't know if celebration is the right word, but we're thankful for all of those men and all of those women who have given their lives in service to our country. Because had they not, we might be German citizens today. How about that one? You know, and so we, we are thankful for the freedom that we enjoy in this country. We have Veterans Day that we celebrated a couple of weeks ago for all of those, whether living or, or not, who have served in our armed forces. And we get together as a country and we say corporately, hey, thank you so much. I mean, we love the freedom that we have. This is great and it's wonderful and we don't want to not appreciate it because usually when you fail to appreciate something is when you end up losing it. But, but I want to add a, a, just a comment to the whole conversation about freedom. And, and it's this, that, and I want you to hear me out on this, that our military is not the only answer to the continuation of our freedom. It is in a large part because we might be British citizens, we might be German citizens, we might just be under the thumb of, of one of our enemies in this world had it not been for our military. So the military is great for those forces that are from without. But what about the stuff from within. Because sometimes we are our own greatest enemy, correct? I mean, we make decisions that hurt our lives. We make decisions that hurt our families. Corporately as a country, we make decisions just kind of on an individual basis that hurts us as a country. And so we, collectively in the United States, we are our own worst enemy. So there's an enemy that's out there that is opposed to freedom that the military really can't deal with it. And, and our founders, whenever they got together and they thought, you know, we're going to have this new country, we really need to give this some, some thought, and we're going to think about, we need some governing documents, we need some things that kind of say, this is who we are, this is who we're not, this is how things are going to work. When they started thinking about our country, they started thinking about the environment in which freedom was going to exist. And they realized that really this idea of freedom that they codified in the Constitution, the Bill of Rights, all those things, all the freedoms that we enjoy as a country, they started thinking about this freedom. They said, you know what, there's something that's got to be here, though. Because if it's not here, there's no way that freedom is going to be able to exist in the way that we have envisioned it to. Really, there is Achilles heel to our freedom. And I'll tell you what it is. And it's a word that they use, and it's called virtue. It's called goodness. We see this happen in our homes, right? I mean, you've raised a kid, you've been a child in a home, you, you do something wrong, your kid does something wrong, you're like, hey, you're grounded for a week. Well, why? Well, we said, you're, you know, you could go out till 10 o'clock and you came home at 10.30 and so now your freedoms are taken away. You abuse the freedom and now freedoms are taken away. You go out and you decide, hey, I'm going to get drunk and I'm going to get in my car and I'm going to get behind the wheel and I'm going to drive and then somebody's going to pull me over and they're going to say, you were driving under the influence. Well, guess what? You abused your freedom to drink and therefore now your license is taken away. You're going to spend a little bit of time in jail because you abuse the freedom. The only way freedoms exist, the only way freedom continues to to be as it is in our lives right now is, is that we are good. We are good individually. It happens in a house. It happens in a home, parent, child, child, parent. It happens like that. It happens collectively in a society. Are you going to get behind the, the wheel of a car or not? And so you, you've got, it, as soon as we cease to be good, then all of a sudden we see freedom kind of draw back. And we've seen that happen a lot in the last couple of years. So our, our founders got together. They wrote some things. And I want to read you what they wrote. John Adams says that our Constitution was made only for a moral and a religious people. It is wholly inadequate to the government of any other. Listen, when you give freedom to bad people, bad things happen. It just does. And then you have to take away the freedom. You give freedom to good things, to, to good people, to moral people, to people who are religious folks and have a fear of God, then good things happen. They can handle the freedom. And our founding father, they recognized that's the environment that, that freedom has to have for it to continue to work well. Samuel Johnson said that no people can be great who have ceased to be good. And so good is the prerequisite of great. And that works in a lot of different ways. It works with God and your Christian life and also works in our society that good is the prerequisite of great. And then Ben Franklin said, only a virtuous people are capable of freedom. As a nation becomes more corrupt and vicious, they have need of more masters. Or in our case, you have need of more laws or a bigger government or a more restrictive government. You have need of more laws that are out there when people abuse the freedoms that they have been given. God says this in Proverbs chapter 14, verse 34, that righteousness exalts a nation. And so God understands that for a nation to be blessed, for a nation to enjoy the freedoms that it has, 
then it's got to be righteous because apart from that righteousness, then freedom collapses in on itself. And so freedom is, is woven into the DNA of who we are as a nation corporately and also individually. <clears throat> but I think it's a biblical thing too. Because when you look at the character of God, God desires this, this distinct freedom for us and he has a plan for you to experience the freedom that he wants you to have. And it's not a North Korea, South Korea thing. It's not America, Soviet Union type of deal. It is a freedom of the soul, a freedom of the spirit, a freedom of, of what's happening on, in you on the inside. And so this plan for this freedom comes through his son Christ. And I want you to look over the Gospel of John, chapter 8. We'll look at verse 31, and we'll kind of bounce down to verse 36. But here's what he says. Jesus is speaking to some Jews who had believed in him. Okay, so these Jews had some kind of level of faith here. They believed in Jesus. And he says, if you abide in my word, it means if you own my word, if it becomes who you are and you agree with it, and you're like, this is how I want to live my life. If you abide in my word, then you are truly my disciples. And you will know the truth. The truth will set you free. And then at the end of it, he says, so if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. So I, here's what happens with us. <clears throat> the, the freedom that God wants to give to us, it doesn't just happen. It doesn't. There's a law of sin. We'll talk about that in just a second. But, but the freedom that God has for us, it only comes when you accept Christ into your life as your Lord and Savior. But that's not all the freedom that he has. Now, I don't want to take away from that. But that's not all the freedom there is. If you got saved as an adult, I think that you could probably understand what I'm, what I'm talking about. You get saved, there is a change in your life. Like there is a new creation in Christ. Old is gone, new has come. You've got a new heart. You're looking at marriage differently. You're looking at life differently. You think about God differently. You pick up the Bible and all of a sudden it's wide open to you. And you're thinking, I never saw this before. It was there, you just didn't see it because you hadn't been saved. So you get saved. But then as you abide in his word, there are other things that are going on in your life that you're really not even aware of. I mean, things, maybe attitudes, beliefs, or maybe sin, vices, habits that you've got that God really wants to kind of get rid of to set you free from some other stuff that kind of has its, its claws in you. And so as you abide in God's word, the truth, you will know the truth. You begin to understand. It's like, yeah, my attitude is really, it's not good. I mean, I know Jesus. I've been saved. I've been set free. But then this attitude is really holding me back towards other people. Maybe it's somebody that sinned against me. And so the truth, the truth, I get to know the truth. And then the truth, it sets me free even more than I was. So I can tell you this about my life, that when I got saved, man, God just completely and totally changed my life. How I thought, what I did, how I spoke, I mean, all those things. But, but there's been things over the years that, that God has said, look, you, you need to be set free from this. There's this thought pattern that you've got. There's this judgment that you've got. There's this thinking that's going on in your mind that you really need to be set free from that. So as I abided in the word and the truth was made known to me, then I was set free in greater ways. And so that's what God is trying to get across to us is there is a freedom that he wants you to experience that, yes, you experience when you come to Christ as Savior, but, man, there is so much more beyond that that God wants to show you. So there's a couple of things about freedom, and they're really theological, but I kind of got to set the groundwork for what we're going to talk about in just a minute. So here, here's the first one. There's the freedom. When, when Jesus comes to live inside of your life, the Bible word for this is you are justified. Okay? You are made righteous in the sight of God. And that is incredibly important to what God is doing in you at that moment of salvation. In the book of Romans, it's talking about two people, one Adam and second Jesus. Okay? So just remember those two names as we work through this. It says, and the free gift is not like the result of one man's sin. So the gift that Jesus brings is not like the result of Adam's sin in the garden. For the judgment that following, uh, following the one trespass brought condemnation. It means when Adam sinned, that sin affected all of the human race for all of eternity. It brought condemnation. But the free gift that Jesus' death on the cross, following those many sins, those many trespasses, that brings justification. For if because of one man's trespass, again Adam, death reigned through that one man, much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. So we have life. We have freedom because of what Jesus Christ has done. So when you trust him as your Lord, what happens is you are justified before God. And I know this is another theological term, but here it goes. God imputes to you the righteousness of Jesus. 
Okay? So let me explain that. He takes what is true about Christ, the righteousness of Jesus Christ, the goodness of Jesus, the purity of Jesus, I mean, just everything that's good about him. And when you trust Jesus, his death on the cross, he puts that in you. He makes that true of you, even though it's not true of you. That's the free gift. That's the grace that we have in Christ. It doesn't mean I'm perfect. It doesn't mean you're perfect. But it means when God looks at you, all he sees is the righteousness of Jesus. It's like you have been clothed with Christ. And when God sees you, he sees his son so that you are righteous in his eyes. That, that's the only way you go to heaven. Heaven isn't going to be a repeat of this place. You got a bunch of good people who do bad things. You know, it's not that way. You're going to have a bunch of good people who are completely redeemed and sinless and without the capacity of doing that. And that only is possible because of what Christ has done for us and Jesus given us or God given us his righteousness. So listen to this. It's in Romans chapter 3, verse 21 through 24. It's out of the New Living Translation, but it's really good. So here it is. For, but now God has shown us a way to be made right with him without keeping the requirements of the law it was promised in the writings of Moses and the prophets long ago. So the Old Testament law, nobody could be righteous. They tried, they failed over and over and over again. But God made a new way through Jesus. He says, we're made right with God by placing our faith in Jesus Christ. And this is true for everyone who believes, no matter who we are. For everyone has sinned, we all fall short of God's glorious standard, yet God in his grace freely makes us right in his sight. He did this through Jesus Christ when he freed us from the penalty of our sins. And so we are made right in God. We're justified by him when we come to faith in Jesus. Second thing that happens with this freedom in Christ is that we are set free from the law of sin and also the law of death. Listen to what it says in Romans 8. It says, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. Let me tell you what the law of sin is. You, you'll know it as soon as I say it. When you want to do something you know you shouldn't do, but you feel powerless not to do it, that's the law of sin. It's like I can't, almost can't help myself. No, the difference between somebody who is a believer and somebody that's not is, is the one who's not a believer is like, man, I, I got nothing to help me. Get over this. I've got nothing to help me work through this temptation. If you're a believer and Christ lives in you, then there's something, there's someone living inside you that empowers you and enables you to say no to that and yes to God. So this, this law of sin in life, it's broken, it's crushed, it's done away with so that we can live now for Christ in a real freedom. But also this law of death is gone too. Death is defeated when Jesus died on the cross because sin led to death. And not just physical death, but, but a spiritual type of man. I just feel dead on the inside. If you want to feel alive on the inside, let me tell you, Jesus is the one that does that for you. So you're set free from this law of sin that led to death. And now death really doesn't lead to death anymore. Now death for us who are believers is this gateway and celebration moment in, in life of just like, I get to go be with the Lord now. Death becomes not an enemy anymore. Now it becomes this friend that's like, I get to go and see him face to face who has changed me and redeemed me and recreated me and done so many incredible things in my life. We look at death completely different, completely different than the rest of the world does because of the freedom that we have in Christ. Now, what do you do though with that? What do we do? Now, we'll switch gears. Christians, what do you do with the freedom that you have been given? What do you do with what you're free to go and do? Because not everybody handles that very well, do they? Because I have Christians, they come and argue with me. And they say, listen, I am free. I am free. They won't always say it out loud. Sometimes we just think it in our, in our minds. I am free. I am free to smoke it. I'm free to drink it. I'm free to do it. I'm free to say it. I'm free to believe it. I am free. And God's going to forgive me because I know that I got him in my heart. When I die, I'm going to go to heaven. So I'm free to go do whatever this momentary passion is right now in our life. That is not how you handle your freedom in Christ. It's not it. It's not it. People want to argue those things, but that's not how God wants you to handle your freedom. Listen to this in Romans 6, 19. He says, For just as you once presented your members, the parts of your body, as slaves to impurity, it means you did it with your hands and your feet and your mouth and your mind, uh, into lawlessness, and it led to more lawlessness. 
He says, so now present the members of your body as slaves to righteousness, leading to sanctification. So instead of what you used to go do, now you do things that God wants you to do, and it leads to more good. It makes you better because you're doing good. It makes other people blessed around you because you've blessed them. And so you take all this that God has given you, this life and this body and this mind and this mouth, and you use it for those things that are good. But that's not what Christians do sometimes, is it? We want to argue about what we're free to do. We want to argue about how we're free to act. We want to argue about all those things. And here, here's how the New Testament puts it. Two, two different passages. The first one is this, don't use your freedom as an opportunity for evil. It says in Galatians 5.13, for you were called to freedom, brothers, only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. And then the second one is don't use it as a cover-up for evil. In 1 Peter chapter 2, it says, live as people who are free, not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil, but living as servants of God. They're kind of saying the same thing, but I think they're looking at it from two different perspectives. On one side, we're thinking about what we're going to do that we know we shouldn't do, and we're thinking to ourselves, you know what, I'm, I'm free. I'm free. I'm free to drink it. I'm free to do it. I'm free to smoke it and to be it and to say it. And so it becomes this opportunity for evil. I'm going to use my freedom to do what I'm thinking about doing. And then the other one is, you've already done it and you're looking back on it now and you're thinking, I was free to do that. Because your conscience is bothering you a little bit so you're trying to justify what it is that you've done. And so it becomes this cover up for, for something that's evil that you've already done. And so either way you're looking at it from before the action or after the action looking back, either way, don't justify what you know is wrong by saying that you were free to do it. Because we do. We say, listen, we, want, we have a conscience in our minds and we start thinking about things in our heart and, we, and we, our conscience begins to bother us and we act against our conscience. Sometimes we act against what the Word of God says. We know what it says to do is wrong, but we act against that. We act against other people. Sometimes we act even against ourselves and we sin against God and we know that it's wrong. And yet we use our freedom in Christ as a justification to do what we know we shouldn't do. So what we're supposed to do is this, is to use your freedom to benefit other people, to do good to them. In Romans 14, it says, do not, for the sake of food, destroy the work of God. Everything indeed is clean, but is wrong for anyone to make another stumble by what he eats. It is good not to eat or drink wine or do anything else that causes your brother to stumble. The faith that you have, keep between yourself and God. And then Paul says this in 1 Corinthians 9. He says, for though I am free from all, I have made myself a servant to all that I might win more of them. And so we ought to use our freedom in Christ, not to exercise our freedom, but to do what's good for the people around us. So let me tell you, that changes everything for us. It changes how you raise children. You know, there's so many times we're sitting in front of the television set, and, and you're an adult, and you know that what you're watching is not real, it's, it's, it's fiction, and, but your kids are in the room, especially when they're little, and, and you've got demonic, occultic, just horrific stuff that people do to each other, and they put it on television, and they make it look really real. And you want to argue, I am free to sit here and watch this stuff, but you know it's doing no good for those kids that are in the room. You're planting thoughts in their mind and seeds in their mind and teaching them things. that you, I don't know why you were teaching those things, but you, you want to watch these, these things that are on television. I'm, my wife, and this is when our kids were, were much, much younger, we would have this conversation. And, uh, and I know maybe this is a little legalistic, but this is, this is how we talk about things. I wanted to watch Walker, Texas Ranger. I mean, really, I did. And my wife was like, they're shooting people. There's, there, there, people are dying on these shows and you have your child sitting in the room with you and I'm struggling with this thing I'm talking to you about. It's like, I wanted to exercise my freedom, but I knew it wasn't the best thing for my kids. And so are you willing to give up what you might be free to do as an adult for the benefit of your children? Let me tell you, I, and I don't, I, don't, I don't have anybody in mind. People think I pick on them when I say these things and I'm not. So there's not a name in my brain right now. I go to the movies sometimes. I'm thinking, you're bringing your child to this? I mean, really? I mean, because you're thinking, I can't, I can't, I want to go watch the show, but I don't have a babysitter, and so I'm just going to bring him with me so that I can exercise my freedom. 
And it's no good. You know it's no good for them. You know what you're doing, even if you don't want to admit it. And so, and then we get into marriage things, you know, and, and, and guys, they want to say, man, I want to stay out till two, three o'clock in the morning. I don't have to tell her when I'm coming home or where I've been. And I am free to do this because I am the man of the house. But listen, does it benefit you when you come home? No, it doesn't. I promise you. I didn't do that. Okay. But this of no benefit to you. It's of no benefit to her. You, you say, this is my phone. This is my phone. And I'm getting personal now. This is my phone. You're not, you, you, you are not looking at my messages. You're not reading my phone. I'm not giving the passcode of my phone. I'm not putting your fingerprint in my phone. I'm going to exercise my freedom because I am free to have my phone and to keep you off of it. But really, does that benefit? Does that benefit anybody? We want to argue from all these positions of freedom what we are free to do and to think and to say to one another. And it does no one any good. Look at our country. I mean, just look around, just kind of, you know, what, what do we have in our country? I'm not going to get into all the details in this, but what do we have in our country under the guise of free speech? What, what good does pornography do? Really, to marriages, to dating relationships, to guys, to girls, what, what good does that do? It doesn't do anybody any good. The exercise of corporately our nation's freedom has just tore people up. We, we had a shooting in a, in a church a couple of weeks ago over in First Baptist Church, Sutherland. We want to exercise our freedom, and, and we do, and we have a freedom to write and bear arms, but as soon as we abuse that freedom, what happens? People begin talking about laws to restrict that freedom. Listen, freedom only exists in this environment that is good and is virtuous. It's the only way it works. The only way it's going to work in your house, it's the only way it's going to work in our country, the only way it's going to work in our church is that we have to be people who are good. And so Paul says, you work for the benefit of other people. It's interesting why he says he does what he does, why he made himself a slave. He put aside his freedom for the good of others. In 1 Corinthians 9, he says, to the weak I became weak, that I might win the weak. I become all things to all people that by all means I might save some. I do it all for the sake of the gospel that I may share with them in its blessings. And so Paul was willing to lay aside his freedom for the benefit of other people that he might have a platform on which to share the gospel. That he might be able to talk to somebody and say, let me tell you about Jesus. So here's how I want to close this morning. Maybe there's something I jogged in your mind. You thought, wow, I never really thought about it that way. But in the exercise of my freedom, I've really been hurting a husband or a wife or a child or, or a family member that, that it's not been good. And I need to be a little bit more grown up, be a little bit more mature, and consider others before I consider my own freedom. I, just, I want you to think about that, okay? Second thing is this, that as you go through life, maybe today and maybe next week, that if God brings this back to your, your mind, your memory, it's, it's for a reason. He's trying, to, he's trying to get in touch with you, trying to get in contact with you so that you begin to think differently about how you've been exercising your freedom. Because, like I said, if you want to grow in your faith, if you really want to mature and have a deeper walk with God, you have to deal with this concept of, of how you handle the freedom that you have in this country to do a lot of things that you really shouldn't do. This of no benefit to you and no benefit to other people. So let's pray together.